Hello everybody, well and just like that it feels like Christmas here even though of course Christmas is almost a month away. Well, happy Thanksgiving to all our American customers. I hope this year you will be surrounded by lots of friends, family, and birds, of course. So today, let's solve the mystery of feeders on the ground or empty feeders in the morning. You fill your feeders in the afternoon, birds feed on them just for a couple of hours before you go to bed. There's still plenty of seed in the bird feeder, but in the morning, either the seed level is really down or the feeder is completely empty, or even worse, it's on the ground and all the seed is gone. Many of you naturally think that it's squirrels that got into the feeder and emptied it in no time. You've seen them do it to other feeders. But squirrels are not nocturnal. They, like us, like to sleep during the night and they don't have the strength and the dexterity to manipulate those feeders. Let's check out what some of you managed to catch on camera. So as you can see, the culprits are either raccoons or deer. So a couple of things that you can do. You can either bring your feeders in at night or you can hang them somewhere where raccoons cannot climb and reach from. And for deer, you know, if they can stick their tongues into the feeder, they will lick it clean. So make sure to hang your feeders high enough so the deer cannot reach them. Last summer, John Petrus observed morning doves and American robins doing weird things on his mulch. So he's curious to find out what they were up to. Hi, John. You've asked me about some unusual behavior by morning doves underneath your feeders, whereupon you suggested the birds are engaging in dusting behavior. You're not far off, but what's unusual in your accompanying photos is that the doves are doing this behavior in your mulch and not in a sandy, dusty area. And it reminded me of a previous question from you concerning robins digging trenches in your mulch, whereupon I suggested the birds were perhaps dust bathing in the material. My guess is that it may also pertain to your doves, particularly to my suggestion that the birds wouldn't be making use of the chemicals in the mulch to kill off ectoparasites. Most of the wood used for making colored mulch comes from recycled wood such as wood scraps, wood pallets, and wood reclaimed from construction and demolition waste. These materials are often contaminated with various chemicals such as creosote and chromated copper arsenate used in the manufacture of pressure-treated wood. Maybe your robins and other birds like your doves have learned that dust bathing in chemically treated mulch confers some sort of anti-ectoparasite benefit. So due to your astute observations, we might have solved a mystery together and one worthy of further research by scientists. Most ornithologists are aware of the concept that in most avian species, the males are quite colorful for attracting mates and fending off competitors, while the females are more drab colored and camouflage for constructing nests and later tending to eggs and young at those nests. Cross-dressing or plumage transvestism has been recorded in at least two bird species, the ruff and the American redstart. But now some species of hummingbirds have been caught in the act of engaging in this rather bizarre form of morphology. A portion of females in some species adorn themselves with male-like coloring and plumage patterns such that they are virtually indistinguishable from males. To follow up on this, a team of scientists studied the white-necked Jacobin in the field in Panama for four years. This relatively common medium-sized hummingbird ranges widely throughout Central and Northern South America. Like all hummingbirds, the white-necked Jacobin feeds on nectar and males use plenty of energy to aggressively drive off male competitors. And also, like most hummingbirds, the males are highly colorful, while the females are generally drab. However, the scientists soon discovered that roughly a fifth of the adult females in the population look identical to adult males and retain that look throughout their lives. So despite looking like males, these cross-dressing females were slightly smaller in size and less aggressive. Also, the juveniles of both sexes resemble adult males. As a result of their findings, the team has hypothesized that the birds do so to avoid most of the costs of male aggression and harassment while feeding. In short, juveniles and adult females with male-like plumage can feed from flowers and hummingbird feeders longer without being bullied. It's a form of deceptive mimicry and may indeed be the first known example discovered within a species. 
last summer I was uh, gardening and then I looked at my feeders and all of a sudden I saw on my suet feeder a very weird looking male hairy woodpecker. When I grabbed my binoculars and my Merlin app, um, I realized that it was actually a female yellow-bellied sapsucker. And now that I've seen one live for the rest of the summer, it was no problem IDing it because yellow-bellied sapsuckers have a lot more white spots than hairy or downy. And their bellies are really quite yellow comparing to uh, hairy and downy woodpeckers. Males and females are pretty easy to distinguish because males have two red spots, one on top of their head and one on their neck, whereas females only have the red cap. That's why I kind of mistaken it for a male hairy woodpecker. Of all the woodpeckers here on the east, yellow-bellied sapsuckers are the only migratory ones. They start arriving at their breeding ground sort of at the beginning of April and then leave and migrate south uh, at the end of September, beginning of October. They come to breed in northern states and a lot of uh, parts of Canada and then they migrate to sort of southern states and uh, Central America. Just like us humans, yellow-bellied sapsuckers absolutely love sap from maples and birch trees. You know, I grew up drinking birch juice. It was such a staple in our household. The sapsuckers would also eat insects, you know, mosquitoes and spiders and whatever they come across when drilling wells in trees. An interesting thing is that a lot of other birds and wildlife will follow yellow-bellied sapsuckers waiting for their turn at those wells that uh, sapsuckers make. We've seen a ruby-throated hummingbird help itself to sap that was left in one of the wells once the yellow-bellied sapsucker was done with it. Absolutely uh, fascinating. Yellow-bellied sapsuckers are cavity nesters. They prefer live trees that have a little bit of fungus or decay in them so it's easier to excavate. Males do all the excavating and females just kind of supervise and only when the excavation doesn't go well or the nest doesn't really work out will females get involved and help. If a particular nesting site works out, the sapsuckers will return to it year after year. They only have one brood per season, on average four eggs are laid, and both parents are very involved with uh, incubating, hatching, brooding, and raising their young. It was absolutely amazing to see how many yellow birds there actually are, not just American goldfinches. So let's check out the top five. Here's the third place, the second place, and the grand prize winner. Our December photo contest is a little bit different. First of all, because it's the last photo contest of 2022, we will have five winners and we are not judging, there is not a theme for pictures, we're actually judging the captions that you will supply with your pictures. So, have fun and good luck, everyone. Well, that's it. That's all for now. Take care, and I'll catch you in two weeks.